Uh, this morning we're calling this message Amazed, Amazed by the Word of God. We're amazed by a lot of things these days, are we not? <laughs> most, most of the time when we think about, you know, we're, we're, we're amazed by something that happens, it's typically because it's, it's, it's not a good thing. Like I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed that we're at this point, I'm, I'm amazed that this happened. I can't believe that this is happening at, at, at this time of year or, or this risk. I'm amazed that we were hit by two hurricanes back to back. That was amazing. I'm amazed that we were, you know, blasted with a, a ice storm, right, in the middle of a, a pandemic. We're amazed by all these things, but you see, above all that, we should be more amazed by who God is. We should be more amazed by God's word, and that's what we'll see this morning—to be amazed by the word of God. And so, I, it just begs me to ask the question: uh, When is the last time that you were amazed by God's word? When is the last time you were amazed by what, what, what you have studied or what you have read in God's Word? Hopefully you were amazed just a moment ago as we were in the Sunday school hour and as we were reminded of, of all that Christ has done for us and, and just the way He dealt with the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus and the, the grace that He showed them and the way He extended to them uh, the wisdom of, 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 of His coming and the way He fulfilled all of the Scriptures and we see the disciples and they were amazed once their eyes were open to realize who it was it was jesus that had met with them and so for us it's the same thing that we should be amazed every time that we open god's word every time we read god's word we should be amazed at the the, the grace that we even have god's word amen that that he wasn't obligated to to speak to us or to reach out to us or reveal himself to us that that we had sinned against him we deserve nothing but His wrath, and yet He loved us and extended us His grace. You see, I believe the only people that would say that they aren't amazed by God's Word are the people that aren't reading God's Word. If you were to say, I'm not amazed by God's Word, all you're doing is telling on yourself. You're saying that you're not reading God's Word. We should be amazed every time we read God's Word. I mean, how could we not? Right? How could we not be amazed by God's Word? It's God's Word. It's the very words of God. It's God breathed. He is speaking to us through His Word. And that is amazing. The very fact that He would love us, that He would speak to us through His Word is amazing. You see, our God is not silent. Our God is not silent. Our God is a speaking God. He speaks to us in many different ways. We are aware of this. So we know that He speaks to us through people. He speaks to us through circumstances. He speaks to us in, in various ways. Sometimes it's visions and, and dreams and sometimes it's in nature. We know many people that just enjoy being outside and saying, I just, I feel like I'm with God and I, I can just feel God's presence as I'm walking through the woods and as I see these flowers, as I stare up into the sky at the stars at night, I just, I just feel like God is speaking to me and just saying, how glorious am I? How glorious am I? See, but the primary way that God has chosen to speak to us is through this. It's through this. It's not through walks in the woods. It's not through looking at the stars. It's not through feelings in our guts. It's through His Word. He speaks to us through the Word. The only way that we can know God is through His Word. You couldn't know God just by looking at creation, looking at nature. He had to reveal Himself through us to us through His Word. We needed special revelation, and that's what He gave us through His Word. The only way we can know what is pleasing to God is through His Word. The only way that we can know how to bring God glory is through His Word. Right? If you want to know how to, to what, what glorifies God and how we can gl bring Him glory, it's not going to be just like, well, this is what I think. I think this will glorify God, and so I'm going to do this. That's the wrong thing to do. We get into God's Word, and God's Word will tell us how to bring Him glory. The only way that we can know that we are loved by God is through His Word. The only way we can, we can know about His grace is through His Word. The only way we can know about His forgiveness is through His Word. The only way that we can know how to be saved from the power and the penalty of our sins is through God's amazing Word. That's it. That's the only way. That's what makes God's Word so amazing. May we never stop being amazed by God's Word. That we get to the point where we're not amazed by God's Word, where we're indifferent towards God's Word, where we're bored with God's Word, we're in trouble. We need revival. We need revival when we get to that point. 
the psalmist was clearly a man that was amazed by God's word. We know that he was amazed by God's word because of the way it affected his his life. The way we can read through Psalm 119 and just listen, right? Read read the words that he wrote. He's clearly a man that was amazed by God and his word. In this stanza that, that, that he wrote, we can see three ways, I believe, that being amazed by God uh, uh, and His Word will affect the way people will live, the lives that people will live. We'll rejoice in persecutions, we'll be relentless in praise, and we'll rest in God's promises. That'll be our outline for this morning. And so go ahead, and if you have your Bibles with you, grab them and let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word uh, this morning. If you don't have it, we'll have it for you on the screen. Psalm 119. Verses 161 to 168 says, Princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. Lord, I hope for your salvation, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. This is God's Word. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've made. We thank you so much for your Word, your amazing Word. We thank you so much for your Son, your amazing Son. We thank you so much for your spirit, your amazing spirit. And so, God, we ask that you would meet with us this morning, that you would teach us your word, and that we would all leave this place better off than when we came in. Not because we have more information about your son Christ, but because we have been transformed by your son Christ. Father, thank you for all that you're going to do here this morning. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I believe the first effect that we see in this in this passage is that when we are amazed by God and His Word, we'll be able to rejoice even in the midst of persecutions. Why? Because of our faith. Because of our faith. Being persecuted because of your faith is part of what it means to be one of God's people. Did you know that? It's normal. That's normal Christianity. Being persecuted is normal Christianity. Other people around the world know this already. We're kind of late to the game in in America, but it's coming. We better get used to it because it's coming for us too. Right? In different ways, in various ways, persecution is already beginning to happen here. We know this. We see it. Persecution is normal. In fact, I would say it's the lack of persecution that's abnormal. That's strange. It's odd. And, and people around the world would look at us here in America and wonder why. You know, how, how is it that they're being faithful to follow Jesus in, in other places? They're being locked up. They're being put in prison. Uh, uh, they're being killed. They're, they're, they're being executed for their faith. And yet here in America, not much of anything. We're able to operate and, 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 and worship as we please for the most part, except for this last year where we had to do some things Differently, but other than that, we're not really persecuted about anything. We're able to do whatever we want to do. So to them, it's abnormal. What they see in America is abnormal. Doesn't make any sense. But you see, the psalmist, he was a man who was very familiar with being persecuted. That he was experiencing a, a, a persecution here in this passage. He says in verse 161, Princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in all of your word. It appears that he was being persecuted by a, a high up, powerful government official. We understand that too. We, we see what political overreach can happen, how that can happen to us, right? We, we see this. It's very near and dear in these days. He was being a, a, a persecuted by a prince, it would say. That he was being persecuted from people that had power to completely wreck his life. You know, uh, we all have someone like that. We all have people that we know. We, we are, we're under the authority of employers. Or, or, or at the very least, the, the government has some, some authority over us that they could wreck our lives if they chose to do so. And they can do it, as he stated here, 
without a cause. You know what that means? Don't have to have a reason. Don't have to have a reason. They don't have to give any, any reason to do it. They can make a charge against you and that's that. You have no way to fight back. They're above the law, as it were. They can make up any charge they wanted. And for the psalmist's case, they did. They would slander him. They would say things about him to, 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 to cause people to disrespect him and to want harm to come to him. And they were persecuting him because of his faith. That's all. Nothing more than that because of his faith in the one true and living God. The psalmist's response to their persecution should be our response. We should respond in the same way that he did. That his heart did not shudder with fear because of his persecutors. I believe his heart stood in awe because of God's word. It stood in awe because of God's word. He feared God far more than he feared man. And we should too. Let's say it one more time. He feared God far more than he feared man. And Psalm 118.6 says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? What are they going to do to me? Throw me in prison? Right? What are they going to do? Take my life? Send me on to glory? Amen. Bring it. Send me to prison like Paul. I'll just evangelize there. I'll save, I'll save everyone in the prison. The jailer too. Do it. See what will happen. See, Jesus gave this word of encouragement to the disciples in, in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 10.28 He says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear, fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. But we're afraid of the wrong individuals. We need to fear God. We need to respect God much more than we do. Instead of being fearful of his persecutors, the psalmist chose to rejoice in his persecutions because of God's word. We see this in verse 162. He says, I rejoice. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. You see, the psalmist could rejoice because he had hidden God's word in his heart. We know this going back to the beginning of the psalm. He treasured it. He hid it away. He protected it. He could rejoice because he understood that persecutions were temporary, but as relationship with God was eternal. It was everlasting. You see, we need to be reminded this morning as well, pain and even death is temporary for a child of God. Pain and even death is temporary for a child of God. The Apostle Paul suffered greatly because of his faith in Christ. It's chronicled for us in the Scriptures. 2 Corinthians 4.17 tells us that he considered his afflictions as light and momentary. Have you read the New Testament? Have you read Paul's letters? Would you say anything about what he suffered was light? And would you say any the duration of his suffering was anything but momentary? But that was his perspective, right? That's how he saw these things. They were they were light and and momentary. He could say those things because he saw things from an eternal perspective. We must have the same type of perspective. Think beyond the now. Think into eternity. This is this is going to be over before you know it. Right? We all know this because the Word of God tells us that Paul rejoiced in the midst of his sufferings because they were for Christ's sake. I believe another example of, of, that we can see in Scriptures of this is, is, is found in, in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, the apostles were arrested and thrown into prison for preaching about Jesus. Religious leaders didn't like that. They wanted to shut them up. Beat them up. Lock them up, tell them to shut up about Jesus, threaten them. But in the middle of the night, you remember what, if you're familiar with this in Acts 5, uh, the angel, an angel came and unlocked the door and sent them out. Sent them out. He didn't just set them free. He told them to go back and keep preaching. Keep on preaching. So that's exactly what they do. And so word got back to the religious leaders and said, hey, didn't, didn't you, didn't you lock them up? Ain't they supposed to be in jail? Aren't they supposed to be shutting, shutting their mouths about Jesus? Well, look what they're doing. They're back doing the very same thing that you told them to stop doing. Filled with, with boldness, they went out and preached the good news. They were arrested a second time. They were threatened by the leaders again. They were beaten severely. And then they were set free. And look at what Luke wrote about their response in verse 41. In Acts 5, 41 says, So they departed from the presence of the council doing what? Rejoicing. Rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Whose name? 
Christ. For Christ, for Christ's sake, for Christ's name, they would suffer gladly. You see, the natural thing to do when being persecuted is to want to shrink back or fight back. Shrink back or fight back. That's our, that's our two responses. You see, rejoicing is not a natural response to being persecuted. It's not. We have to be trained. We, we have to grow in this. You see, it's not natural, but, but God's people aren't natural people, are we? We're not, we're not supposed to be natural people. God's people are supernatural people. That God's people rejoice when others retreat because God's people have God's word. I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon. He says, we are not likely to be disheartened by persecution or driven by it into sin if the word of God continually has supreme power over our minds. Supreme power over our minds. What, what, what is it that fills our heads? Is it God's Word? Or is it our circumstances? Or is it the threats? Or is it fear? Right? All these things have to be pushed out and fill our head and our mind. Our, our, our thoughts must be filled with God's Word. See, it's likely that one of the main ways that the psalmist was being persecuted was that he was being slandered to ruin his reputation. Has any of you in here been slandered before? <laughs> somebody bear a false witness against you maybe a co-worker trying to get your job trying to get you out of the way or something like that it's hard it's, it's hurtful isn't it? it makes you mad we know this that, that i believe lies were being told about the psalmist to disgrace him and to discredit him in verse 163 says i hate i hate i hate he said i said it just dislike he said i hate it he says i hate and abhor lying but i love your law Everyone hates a liar. Everyone hates a liar. Even God. You say, whoa, whoa. God don't hate. God don't hate no one. You better read your Bible. God is capable of hate. And He does hate. We know this. Proverbs 6.17 tells us that God hates a lying tongue. God hates a lying tongue. Nobody likes a liar. The psalmist hated and abhorred lying, but he loves God's Word. He loved God's Word because God's Word is entirely and eternally true, just like we saw last week. You see, when we're amazed by God and His Word, it's going to affect us. Amen? It will. It's, it's going to impact our lives. When we are amazed by God and His Word, we will rejoice even in the midst of persecutions because of our faith in Christ. Amen? We will. We will. Be, be ready. Effect number two that we see. Effect number two. When we are amazed by God and His Word, we will be relentless in our praise for the peace that He has established our hearts and our minds. But we also can tell, just as we've been reading through this psalm, we know that the psalmist was a man of relentless prayer from these previous stanzas. But we also can tell and know that, that, that God's Word tells us to be people of relentless prayer. We're told this. Right? To pray without ceasing. We, we, the Word of God tells us to do this. When we are people of relentless prayer, we will become people of relentless praise. Right? They, they go hand in hand together. And, and, and what's strange is we, we know, we notice this because it seems to be so hard for us to give God praise. It does. When we gather for prayer time, either before Sunday school or Wednesday night prayer meeting, when we ask for prayer requests, we get lots of prayer requests. We get this one's having surgery. Uh, uh, this one's uh, 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 got this going on. This one has the COVID. This one's whatever. We have a long, long list. And we say, okay, what can we praise God about? And it's crickets. It's silence. Why, why can't we give God praise? Why, why are we so stopped up with being able to give God praise and share praise reports? We, we, it's a strange thing. And so we have this. When we're relentless in our prayer, we'll be relentless in praise. And so, so why is that? What's the connection? I believe the connection is, is because our perspective on things change. When we're looking for reasons to give God praise, we'll find reasons to give God praise. When we want to be people of praise, we'll see things that will give God praise. We'll see things from God's perspective. That God will give us wisdom and discernment to see things the way he does, to see things rightly, even the bad things. Right? Even when bad things happen, when difficulties happen, troubles come our way, we'll still be able to see them for what they are and praise God anyway. 
We see these two central truths of our faith clearly in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. It says, Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for your life. You know, I've had so many people say, Well, Brother Mike, I, I just don't understand. How, how, how can we know God's will? How can we? God's Word will tell us. If, if you're not sure about anything else, you can go to this verse here in verse 18. He says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What is it? To pray without ceasing. That's God's will for you. To, 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 in everything, give thanks. To be thankful, that's God's will for you. There's two things right there. You say, I don't know what God's will is. There's two. I just gave you two. And there's many, many more. But it's, it, we need to look at verse 18 again a little more closely. Notice, notice verse 18 says, in everything. It didn't say for everything. In everything, not for everything. Christians aren't sadists, right? We don't, we don't, we don't just, just enjoy being punished. We don't enjoy pain. We don't enjoy suffering. We don't seek it out needlessly. We're not thankful when our loved ones get diagnosed with cancer, right? Guess what? Stage for a camera. Jehovah Jireh, praise the Lord. The Lord has provided. We don't do that. You go to the nut house if that's your attitude when you, you hear some bad news like that. But we can be thankful in it. We can be thankful in it when we get this because we know who God is. We can be thankful when the, we, those things do come because we know that God is good and all of His ways are good. All of His plans and purposes are good. We can still rejoice. We know because Romans 8.28 tells us. So I'm pretty sure that the psalmist wasn't thankful for his persecutions. I'm sure he wasn't thankful for the lies being told about him. I'm sure... In your own personal experience, that wasn't the first thing to come into your mind when you're being slandered. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the slander. This is going to be a great day. No, that wasn't, that wasn't your thought. It wasn't his thought. But you see, the psalmist was able to be thankful in his persecutions and give God continual praise because of God's past faithfulness to him. And it's the same way for us in our own lives. We look back and say, has God been faithful to us in past, in the past days? Yes. Every single time. He has never not one time let us down. He has always provided. We see the psalmist's response in verse 164. He says, seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. I believe the number seven here is it's symbolic. It's not literal. He's not just saying that. He's like counting and saying seven times. All right, number one, I praise you and I stop. Number two, I praise you and just kind of setting up during his day to, 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 to praise God these different times. I believe it represents going above and beyond what was expected in Judaism. You see, in, in Judaism, there's only like three official prayer times. Right? The, the morning prayers, the afternoon prayers, and the evening prayers. And so, that's what he's kind of pointing to here. I believe this is similar to what Jesus did when he told the disciples uh, to not only forgive people seven times. Right? Remember that was a question? How often should we forgive? And they said up to seven times. He says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. That's what he's expecting. Right? So, so I think that's what's kind of happening here with the psalmist. And so how, how many times do we stop throughout the day and give God praise? Right? How, how often do we do that? I, I, think, I think it's not. If, if it's only seven times, it's not enough. Seven times is not enough. We have so much to give God praise for. We have so much to thank God for every single day, even in the worst day that you're having, a horrible day where it seems like nothing but bad keeps happening, we can still give God praise for what He has done. See, if we're honest, we don't give God nearly enough praise. We don't give Him enough praise. We, we'll pray, give prayer requests. We'll pray and, and give God our to-do list. Give them a chore list. God, we need this done. We need this done. I need this healed. I need this fixed. I, I, need, I need this repaired. I need money for this. I need money for that. And, this, and if, you know, if you could get this done quickly, that'd be great. We give Him our list of things to do for us, but we won't give Him praise. We need to give God more praise. You see, we take all that God does for us for granted on most days. We just come to expect it. That God is faithful. And we should expect Him to be faithful. We should still give Him praise. Still say, thank you for being so good to us. You see, it seems these days that God has to do something truly amazing in our lives to get us to stop and give Him praise. It has to be something borderline miraculous. Then we'll stop and say, man, hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. You get that report back from the doctor and the cancer is gone. 
praise God. You won't tell everybody then. You see, we've got to be more, more open and more willing to give God praise for even the small things. You see, God deserves to be praised for everything that He does for us. He deserves it. Not only should we pray without ceasing, we should give God praise without ceasing too. Right? Every time we pray, there should be praise involved in that time that we set aside. Every single time. Besides all the seen and unseen things that God has done for us on a continual basis, you know how you keep breathing right now? You know how you're still alive because of God? God's making all these processes in your mind and in your body and in your brain working right now. God is the one doing that. See, we can never give God enough praise for sending His Son, Jesus, to the cross for us. You say, well, I'm not sure what I have to give thanks to God for. Give thanks to God for that. Give God praise for that, that Jesus went to the cross to atone for our sins. We'd be eternally condemned right now because of our sins, but we're not for Jesus. If Jesus has not done what He has done for us through His death and resurrection from the cross, so if you placed your faith in Christ, you can praise God for Romans 8.1. Praise God for that. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. It didn't say some condemnation. It says none. No. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Man, that, that should give you praise. I want to praise God for verses like that. Truth like this. See, by grace and through faith we have made peace with God and we have been empowered to live in peace with one another. The psalmist knew this. He knew this same kind of peace. He says in verse 165, Great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. You see, great peace comes through a right relationship with a great God. That's the only way you can have this great peace that the psalmist was speaking of here. If we love God, we must love God's Word. If we love God, we must love God's Word. We must love God's mission. We must love God's people. If we love God's Word, we won't let anyone or anything cause us to stumble, to stumble, or more, more uh, precisely, to fall away. Because we stumble every day, right? We stumble in sin, and we, that's why we have to keep coming back and asking for forgiveness and, and to repent of the sins that, that we've committed against God and against others. But you see what we're looking at here and what the psalmist is talking about, uh, the Warren Wiersbe, he said this, he's talking about this praise, he says, a singing saint, is a stable saint. <laughs> a singing saint is a stable saint. I think that's a great way to think about it. We have a song in our hearts, right? That we're going to give, give God praise. We're going to find something to give God praise about. You see, we're never prone, more prone to stumble in our faith than when we have not taken the time to hide God's Word in our hearts. Right? The psalmist knew this. We were talking about it in Sunday school this morning in the men's class. Everybody knows when we haven't spent time with Jesus. Everybody can see it. You can see it in your own life and everybody else can see it in you by the way you respond, or the way you act, your, your attitudes and actions are, are, are shaped. You, you say, I can tell you've been with Jesus. I can tell when you hadn't been with Jesus. Everybody knows. The psalmist knew the value of spending time with God and His Word. Psalm 119, all the way back in the beginning. Verses 10 and 11, he says, With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, that I may not stumble. When we're amazed by God and His word, it's going to affect us. It will. It has to. When we're amazed by God and His word, it will uh, be relentless. We will be relentless in our praises for God and all that He has done for us. Amen? Relentless. Ongoing. Without ceasing. The third and final effect that we see in our passage is that when we're amazed by God and His Word, we will be able to rest in the promises of God's Word. Rest. <laughs> Talking with Tommy this morning. Tommy. <laughs> Second, you say your name. Ronnie this morning. Say, I'm tired. Say, I need rest. We was talking about that. There's been so much going on these, these last few days, these last few weeks. We've all been so busy. We're all exhausted. 
mentally exhausted, physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, and, and we need rest. And so we've always needed rest. This is a spiritual rest that we're talking about here. The psalmist is talking about. You see, everyone knows that a promise is only as good as the person making the promise. You, you have people in your life that will say they're going to do something for you, and you kind of just roll your eyes, right? Because you know they're not, right? They, they, they'll say they're going to do something, and then they won't. But then there's other people in your life, thank God for those individuals, that when they say, hey, I'm going to show up, they're going to show up. That when they say they're going to do something for you, they're going to do it. You can mark it down. You don't have to worry about it. You know they're going to come through. We know that. The ones who have betrayed us before, they have a pattern. They've lied to us before, and they'll likely lie to us again. We wish it weren't so, but that's likely what will happen. We've come to expect that from them. Because sometimes liars, they're, li- they're liars because they lie, right? <laughs> that's, just, that's just the way it is. And we thank God for the people in our lives that will not lie to us. They'll always tell us the truth. They'll keep their word. You see, the God of the Bible is a promise-keeping God. The God of the Bible is a promise-keeping God. Every promise that God has given to us through His word, He has kept or He will keep. He will keep. Right? When God says that He will do something in His Word, we can rest assured that it will get done. Numbers 23.19 tells us that, that this truth plainly. Numbers 23.19 says, God is not a man that He should lie, nor a son of man that He should repent. Has He said and will He not do? Or has He spoken and will He not make it good? See, when God says that He will forgive our sins, guess what? That's what He'll do. That's what He'll do. It's a promise. When God says that He will never leave us nor forsake us, guess what that is? It's a promise. It's a promise. It's a promise from His Word. When God says that He will bless us when we live in obedience to Him, it's a promise. When He says that He'll get justice for us from our enemies, it's a promise. When He says He he will save us from the power and the penalty of our sins and give us everlasting life through faith in His Son Christ, that is a promise. It's a promise. We can rest in God's promises. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through Him might be saved. You see, promises. That's a promise. right? There, there's, there's, no, there's no question mark anywhere in verses 16 or 17. It's a promise. The psalmist rested in the same promises of salvation that we do today. Verse 166, he says, Lord, I hope for your salvation and I do your commandments. I hope for your salvation. And to be clear, he wasn't saying, I hope it happens. That's not what he's saying. He didn't, like some people would say nowadays, and you ask him and say, hey, are you saved? I hope so. You ever heard somebody say that? I said, man, alive, don't, you, you need to say, I know so. Because if you're saved, you know it. Hope, it ain't, it, ain't like, it ain't like you made a mistake and you locked your keys in your car, right? You know, I, I hope I, or I left the house and I hope I locked the door before I left. You know, that might cause you to get, you know, lose some of your goods and materials. Someone might break into your house and steal all your stuff. But if you're wrong about your salvation, there's no coming back from that. That's not what he's saying. He doesn't say, I, I, I hope I'm saved or I have hope. He says, I hope for. He's, he's looking forward to it. It's a promise. It's a promise. He, he's resting in the promise of his salvation. And although the psalmist had the, the, the hope of experiencing eternal salvation by his faith, just like us, he also had the hope that God would save him from his enemies in the, the present. You see, God does that too. You know, we need, we need to look forward but we also need to spend time in the present. So, because sometimes we get so, so forward looking that we forget that God is active in the present. That He wants to work in our lives now, not, not just in eternity, but now. He wants to redeem now and rescue now and provide, you know, answer and give us promises now. He wants to bless our lives now in the present. You see, when times get tense and troubles begin to mount and intensify, we can be tempted to take matters into our own hands. Amen? <laughs> when, when God's not moving fast enough, 
right? We tend to take matters in our own hands. That maybe God's busy doing something else because I need His help now. That we're in a bind now, and and so maybe God's testing me. Maybe He's wanting me to do something. Maybe that's what's happening. You know, we always justify why we do the things that we do. But you see, it's in those difficult seasons of life that our faith is put to the test, right? That's when our faith is put to the test in these seasons where we have to wait on God. That strengthens, that builds up our faith. And how we respond to those difficult seasons of life reveal whether we really believe that God keeps His promises or not. (laughs) Right? Is God going to be faithful or not? Do I believe God or not? Do I believe God's Word or do I not believe God's Word? That's what it comes down to. Sometimes God will push our faith to the breaking point until He keeps His promise. That's what He did with Abraham and Isaac, if you're familiar with the story in the Old Testament. That's what He did with them, that, 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 that God asked Abraham to offer him his son, his only son, as a sacrifice. Abraham had been waiting a lifetime. He was an old man before God kept His promise to give him a son. And now, here God is coming back to him, saying, give me back your son. Offer him as a burnt offering to me. And Abraham was in a pickle. He had to just wreck his heart and his soul to think, what am I to do? But you see, God had promised to give Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars of the heaven and the sand of the seashore. You see, was God going to keep His promise or not? Was He going to be faithful to him or not? And so how was God going to work all this out? Because you see, He had promised Abraham that, but now He's telling Abraham to give him back his son. See, Isaac was Abraham's only legitimate son on the, and the only way that God could keep his promise to make Abraham's descendants into a great nation. If he killed his son, would, would he in fact nullify God's promise? He had to be thinking this. I would. Like, how, oh, well, hang on. First of all, it's, it's crazy that you want me to, to, to offer my son. But, but then again, you've already said you're going to make me into a great nation, but yet you want me to, to, to do away with the, the very means that you're going to make me into a great nation. This doesn't make any sense. See, not everything God tells us to do is going to always make sense. It's not, but it's going to be good. You see, God wasn't going to let that happen. He had a plan to keep His promise to Abraham. Abraham just needed to know that he could rest in God's promises. He could rest in God's promises even when they didn't make sense. Even when he didn't know how it would happen. We see this in the Scriptures. Look at Genesis 22. Genesis 22, 6-18, we see this. It says, So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Isaac's starting to see something's missing here. Something's up. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my 
voice. So what does resting in God's promises look like for you and me? It looks like obedience. It looks like obedience. That's what it looked like to the psalmist in his life. Verse 167 and 168, he says, My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. You see, it was embedded deep in the psalmist's soul to keep and obey God's Word. He had determined. He was resolved. <laughs> right? We just think that. He was resolved to keep God's Word. His obedience to God and His Word was directly connected to His love for God and His Word. You see, he wasn't about having Bible studies just for information purposes. He wanted to have Bible studies. He wanted to know God's Word so he could do God's Word. He could apply God's Word to his life. He loved God's Word. And in John 14, 15, Jesus told His disciples this. He says, If you love Me, keep My commandments. Keep My commandments. Do what it says. Obey My Word. The psalmist was also comforted, I believe. He was comforted, not intimidated by the fact that God knew His every move. That God knew everything about Him. God is all-knowing. You see, there's nothing about you, there's nothing about me that God doesn't know. There's nothing that you say that God does not hear. There's nothing that you do that God does not see. You see, for the psalmist, he was not intimidated. He was comforted by this. It was comforting to him to know this. That God saw all of his fears. That God saw all of his failures. That God saw all of his lapses in faith. And yet, he was still able to rest in God's promises. God loved him. And God loves you. God loves me in the same way. Nothing can change that. You see, as God's people, we can do the same thing. We can rest in God's promises in the same way that the psalmist did, but there's a catch. Isn't there always a catch? And in fact, there's not one catch, there's two. There's two catches. We cannot obey God's Word if we do not know God's Word. We cannot obey God's Word if we do not know God's Word. And catch number two, we cannot rest in God's promises if we do not know God's promises. Do you know God's Word? Do you want to know God's Word? Do you know God's promises? Do you want God to, to keep His promises to you? See, when we know God's Word, we'll desire to keep God's promises, that He will keep them for us. When we are amazed by God and His Word, it is going to affect us. It will. It has to. It's going to affect everything about us, our, our lives. When we are amazed by God and His Word, we will rest in God's promises. Rest. The type of rest that we need is only found through a relationship with God and through His Word. So this morning as we close, first I want to address my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want to ask you again, are you still amazed by God and His Word? Or have you grown indifferent towards God and His Word? Because it can happen. It can happen. We, we can become, we can grow cold, we can grow indifferent, we can grow bored, we can get into a funk, we can get into a rut. All of us can. That's why we need revival. All of us. Revival. Ongoing. Daily revival. Weekly revival. Monthly revival. And, and don't just wait for the church or another church to to bring in a singing group and, and, and some evangelist to revive you. You better learn to be able to ask God to revive you on your own. Because you might wither up and just dry up and blow away if you're waiting for the next revival meeting to come. And you may or may not experience revival then. Right? We must revive ourselves. Ask God to revive us on an individual level. Revelation 3, 15 and 16 tells us that God would rather we be cold or hot towards Him and His Word. Did you know that? He'd rather you be cold or hot. Not somewhere in the middle. Don't be lukewarm. God cannot stand our indifference towards Him and His Word. Revelation 3 says it makes Him sick. It makes Him sick. He'll vomit us out is what it says. See, the psalmist hated and abhorred liars. God hates and abhors lukewarm Christianity. Lukewarm Christianity. Notice I said lukewarm Christianity. He didn't, I didn't say he hates lukewarm Christians. He loves us. He loves us. He loves his children. But he hates lukewarm Christianity. How we practice 
our faith. He hates it. See, Revelation 3.16 also tells us that when we are indifferent towards God and His Word, our indifference makes God want to vomit. To vomit, it makes Him sick. You see, God expects and deserves excellence and passion from His people. God expects and deserves excellence and passion from His people, not mediocrity and indifference. You want to be great at something in life? You want to excel at something in life? Be great and excel at following Jesus. That's where you should strive to be great. He expects and deserves excellence and passion from all of us. So this morning, let's ask God to make us white hot with passion for Him and His Word. White hot. right? White hot with passion for Him and His Word. Let's ask God to help us to never stop being amazed by Him and His Word. That we'd be able to rejoice in persecutions that come because of our faith. That people know that we follow Jesus and that's the, cause, the reason that they hate us. They despise us because they know they can see it. They can see how we live our lives. They can hear it in our words that we follow Jesus and they can't stand it. That we would be relentless in our praise for our amazing God. We would look for opportunities to stop and pause and give God praise. Even for the small things throughout the day. That we would rest in God's amazing promises that He has given to us as His people in His amazing Word. See, For those of you here this morning that have not yet trusted Christ, I would ask you to do something different. You see, you need to ask God to amaze you with His grace today. Overwhelm you with His saving grace. You need to ask God to reveal Himself to you in a saving way. That's what you need. That's where it needs to begin for you. To be reconciled back to Him. See, the bad news is, you're not okay. You may think you're okay, and, and people may have told you that you're okay. Maybe mom and daddy say that you're okay. But guess what? God's Word says you're not okay. If you have not trusted Christ, you're not okay. You and God are not on good terms. You're, you're, you are far, far from being okay. So the bad news is that your sin condemns you and separate you from God right now. That's the bad news. But you see, there's good news also. There's some good news available also. The good news is that you can be okay before you leave here this morning. We don't have to run a credit check or anything. It can happen on the spot this morning. You can be reconciled with God today. You can be saved today. Your condemnation can be removed from you today. You say, well, Brother Mike, that sounds good. How, how does this happen? By believing in Jesus. By turning from your sins and believing in Jesus. Believe in Jesus and your sins will be forgiven. That means that your condemnation will be removed. All of it. Not just some of it. All of it. Believe in Jesus and you'll be reconciled back to God. That means there will be no more separation. Never again will you be separated from God. That, that, that He will never leave you nor forsake you. That's one of the promises we've already talked about earlier. But you see, the choice is up to you. Only you can choose to follow Jesus. This is only a choice that you can make. Your mom can't make it for you. Your dad can't make it for you. Your, your, your husband can't make it for you. Your wife can't make it for you. This is up to you. You must make this decision for yourself. So I pray that you would make the right decision this morning. Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have given us. You are an amazing God and you have an amazing word. Father, we ask that you would forgive us where we have grown cold towards you. We ask you to forgive us where we have grown cold towards your word. God, you expect and you deserve excellence from us. You expect and deserve passion from us as your people. So God, I, I pray that today you, you would stir us up. That, that you would ignite a fire in our hearts. Make us be the passionate people that you want us to be. Help us to strive to be the excellent people that you want us to be. God, we thank you for your work in this place. God, I pray for those that are gathered here this morning with us. Maybe those who are watching on Facebook Live, God, that You would touch their hearts, that You would stir them up, 
the ones who have not yet believed. Maybe the ones who have been deceived by others. To Someone has told them that they're okay. That, that, that they are basically good people and you know, if, if, if there is a heaven and a hell, then they would go to heaven because they're basically good people compared to others. That's simply, that's not true. Not according to God's Word. Not according to Your Word. It's not true. So God, I pray that You would stir them up. That You would reveal Yourself to them in a saving way. That this might be the day of salvation for them. That they would not only be amazed by You, amazed by Your Word, but I'll be amazed by Your saving grace. So God, I pray that You would meet every need in this room today, whatever it might be. Whether it's a physical need, whether it's a, a, a need for physical rest, or emotional rest, or mental rest. Father, I pray that You meet that need. If there's a financial burden, if there's any, any need, that someone may have in this room today, that you would meet that need. God, I pray specifically, though, for those that have not yet trusted Christ. God, I pray that today will be the day of salvation. That those individuals would would trust Christ and that you would resolve their greatest problem, their greatest need. That you would forgive them of their sins and you would reconcile them back to yourself through your Son, Christ. We love you, Father. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.